Good morning and happy Wednesday and happy politics. Uh, it's another edition of BC Poly Hot Stove. I am McLean Kay. I am the editor-in-chief of The Orca, and I am joining you live from my kitchen table in Victoria. And I am joined, well, not quite in person, by... Closely, uh, socially distanced, Jordan <laughs> Bateman. I'm here at uh, ICBA, Independent Contracts of Business Association, World Headquarters, Metro Town, Burnaby, British Columbia. You, you know, just before we went on the air, uh, when we're queuing up things, um, the first thing we see on the screen is the ledge, and Jordan asks if I can see the ledge. And I chuckled because I thought, you know, in about three weeks, I'm gonna. <laughs> yes, yes, they're headed back. Um, gonna be very different. I thought you had a great piece on the Orca, kind of starting Thank to you. tug at little threads as to how this might actually work. Um, I imagine there are some MLAs that we won't see as much of. I would imagine anyone at yeah. health risk. Um, I'm begging Ralph Sultan, please stay home. Like, uh, yeah. you know, people like that. But uh, you mentioned politics is back. I feel like politics is back. And, uh, you know, I, for one, as a political animal, could not be happier. I say let's uh, start having the, uh, the cut and thrust of politics again. Nothing will get us back to normal more than... Uh, NDP hypocrisy, BC liberal opposition, <laughs> uh, tough questions, holding Trudeau to account. This is what this country needs. Um, we got to start uh, looking at the uh, COVID fallout and where we go from here. Well, let's start. I need. I think the first issue that I you are I think uniquely well suited to comment on is uh, there was an issue raised this week about uh, Highway One upgrades mm -hmm. and cost overruns therein. Uh, this isn't a new issue, of course, but I, I think the the ballooning cost uh, is much higher than the previous ballooning cost. Yeah, kudos, what's happening there? Kudos first of all to former Transportation Minister Todd Stone, who uh, really kind of beat the drum for this uh, in the media found the uh, documents and pointed out the, um, the cost overruns. There's uh, another phase. So essentially from Kamloops to the uh, Alberta border, the plan is to improve Highway 1. It's mainly two lane the whole way. They want to make it four lane, make it safer, all those important things. This has been a project that the BC Liberals started uh, back uh, when they were in power. This will go on beyond the NDP's time in power, whether that's four or eight, you know, four or eight years. It's, this is a long-term project. However, they do it in, in portions. And um, for some reason, the NDP have decided that all of these projects on that Highway 1 stretch will be uh, subject to the union monopoly, uh, essentially saying uh, said they've set up a crown corporation to hire only union workers, um, and you know they're going to cut out 85% of the construction workforce in favor of the 15% who just happen to give them all the money and um, <laughs> votes and uh, other things that come with uh, key support. So... All that to say, the second uh, kind of big contract came out. We had one last year. Um, I'm going to butcher the name, but, but um, yes. it, it was uh, about $25 million over budget, and that's, that was about 25%, which is kind of the ballpark that we see when you um, cut out uh, so much of the labor force. This one um, was $61 million over its $200 million budget. Um, and it wasn't just $61 million over the $200 million budget, but they've actually cut out some expensive portions of the work in order to even get it down to uh, that portion. Um, so now you're talking about a project that's 30% over budget. They haven't even broken ground yet. Um, you know, it, it really does show you what happens when you remove certain companies, a number of companies from bidding on the work, uh, when you uh, add in the risk of having the government manage your workforce instead of you managing your workforce. Um, these things get a lot more expensive. And at a time where, I don't know, $61 million could be put to much better use in this province in a whole number of ways. Uh, you know, for example, all of the uh, lotto grants, all the gaming grants in the province total about $140 million. Casinos aren't open. There's mm -hmm. a lot of talk among the nonprofit sector. Are, are we going to get these grants? Uh, $61 million goes a long way towards covering that $140 million shortfall. But instead, the uh, NDP have decided to give it over to their beloved building trades unions, and that's bad news for taxpayers. Well, yeah, I mean, there there was room before in the the budget to to make choices like this, um, whether you think they're good or bad. And I know that you and I t t tend to lean the same way on this question, but there's no there's no room anymore. Like they're going to have to start making harder decisions about uh, about some of these things. And um, it it got brought up this week, and we'll I I don't think things are going to change. No. But uh, at the very least, it's getting some attention. Well, think about it. Like $61 million is a high school. Uh, you know, you could yeah. build another high school in Surrey for $61 million. All you parents, uh, when your kids do go to school, they go to school in portables. Your high school money has now been spent on a cost overrun on a little piece of Highway 1 because the NDP can't manage labor properly or because they're, uh, they've given a sweetheart deal to their supporters. So this is where 
it gets frustrating because um, money's not growing on trees this, these days. Um, yeah, BC would started this out in better shape than most provinces. That was due in part to the you know 16 years of BC Liberal rule, as the NDP liked to spit, um, and also you know the last couple of years the NDP have balanced the budgets. Uh, but we, we started on that strong footing. We don't, but we still don't have the resources just to be throwing money away willy-nilly on stupid things. We need every dollar we can to make sure that it's going to getting the economy going again. And you think about the workers who are working on that Highway 1 project, you could have a whole nother set of workers working somewhere on a high school for $61 million. But instead, it's just a, uh, like I said, that sweetheart deal. I, I should mention, McLean, uh, ICBA has been fighting this with a number of co- yes. other construction associations yeah. and two progressive unions in court. Um, the judge, in our opinion, uh, in our first uh, crack of this, erred and said this was a labor relations board issue. But we're not challenging the collective agreement itself. We're challenging Claire Trevina's right to impose it, uh, mm-hmm. which is a constitutional thing that needs to go back to the courts. Anyways, all that to say, we filed an appeal this week. Uh, in the BC Court of Appeals, we feel we have a very strong case uh, to get a judge to again look at um, whether uh, the minister overstepped her bounds constitutionally. And uh, there's, we're hoping for a court date in July. There's an opening on the calendar, but it means the government would have to accept the July court date. So you can bet we're probably not going to get it till <laughs> later in the year. This issue, I think, is a little more straightforward. Uh, the one we were just talking about, I should mm-hmm. say. The next thing I want to talk about is one of those ones that, you know, I think you might have had a similar reaction at first where you see the story and you kind of go, huh, I wonder I wonder what I think about this. I need to chew on this. And I, or I'm talking, of course, about Mayor McDreamy, uh, Brad West of Port Coquitlam. Um, the story emerged that he is also um, uh, has a salary with the Steelworkers Union. Um, this is on addition to his, his – his, this is not like a Victoria City Council thing where it's a part-time job. This is a full-time job being the mayor of Port Coquitlam. I think the salary is north of $130,000 a year. That's one fifty. What are your thoughts? So he gets one thirty something from for being mayor of Port Coquitlam. Yeah. Plus TransLink, plus Metro Vancouver, plus 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 plus. So you know, conservatively, we don't know, but let's say another fifteen thousand. That would be very conservative. That's yeah. not very many communities. So you get about one hundred and fifty girl from the taxpayers of the Lower Mainland. You're also getting one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars U.S. From a U.S.-based uh, union, labor union, the steel workers that just happen to have uh, incredibly strong ties to the governing NDP, you're also getting that for a job that includes lobbying. Mm-hmm. McLean, I have many thoughts on this. Yes. At first, at first, I was torn. At first, I was torn because I'm, yeah. you know, I'm a capitalist. I was a township mm-hmm. councilor. I was a township yep. councilor in Langley, but I had a real job as well. Um, mm-hmm. My real job suffered because I was a township councillor and that ate up more time than you know you think a part-time job should or would. But you make that sacrifice. No one held a gun to my head. I made that decision and it all worked out fine. Generally though, so all that to say, yeah, I understand that you have a second job at, at times. However, I think municipal taxpayers generally pay their mayors a full-time salary because they expect the mayors to be working full-time for them. And this is where Brad West gets into trouble. So, you know, which of these masters is he screwing over? Is it the taxpayers that he's screwing over by not working at a full-time clip? I don't think it is, because I think I generally see him doing stuff. Or is it the steel workers? And as I was driving into work today, another thought came to me. Brad West, best known famously for uh, crying and complaining about the Chinese sponsorship of the UBCM. A foreign Mm. power sponsoring municipal politicians much like a foreign union sponsoring municipal politicians. And guess who the United Steelworkers' number one competitor is for steel in the world? China! (laughs) Like, like this is the stoop, this is like, don't tell me it's not coloring the way he's doing his job. It very clearly is. Now, should China be sponsoring UBCM receptions? No, that's stupid, but Brad West, probably not the pristine poster boy for this issue, that the media, and I'm looking at you, CKNW, because you love having this guy on daily sometimes to talk about it. Like, it just kind of, so as I thought, I was getting, like, at first I'm like, capitalist Jordan, okay, yeah, he's, mm-hmm, everyone's mm-hmm. going to have a side job. I mean, I'm, I'm sure on Unspun, George Affleck probably, you know, he still had his business, marketing business while he was working, but there's an expectation that your mayor is working full time and that your mayor is wholly dedicated to your issues. But we have examples of where Brad West is carrying out political agendas that just happen to fit so snugly with U.S. steelworker policy. Like, yeah, 
I, I agree with you. I, I think if the side job had been something like a political communications firm in George's case, or you know, was a uh, was a junior hockey referee on the side, a veterinarian. It's not same, yeah, exactly. There, another good example. The, but this is you're right. It's literally political lobbying. It's included in the job description. Now, Brad West says he doesn't lobby, and that's fine. We have no reason to disbelieve him, but... Except his job, job description. description. <laughs> okay, but it's in the job description. The other reason that is... Um, the, the whole reason we even know about this is not because this has come up in Canada, but through U.S., through U.S. tax filings. Um, he had not... Uh, Mayor West had not disclosed his salary uh, before. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, now, now, now that you know how much he makes, you can kind of see why. It, it's At the very least, it's suspicious. The thing that's galling, I think, is that... There seems to be a, a lot of people who are willing to just move on and say there's nothing to see here. It's not even worth considering or chewing over. And that's not to say that he's suddenly magically a bad mayor. That's no. not to say that he's suddenly magically a bad person. It's just to say, well, hey, let's at least look at this. Because at the very least, it's unusual. And it's interesting that we found out the way we did. Again, these are not condemnations. These are merely questions to be asked and a discussion to have with them. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't seem to be happening. There is some local media interest, but there is not the same firestorm that mm-hmm. you might expect had some of Mayor West's uh, activities been less fashionable. And again, I mean, I'll be the first to say, yes, I was impressed with the way they held the line on property taxes in Port Coquitlam. This doesn't mean he's a bad mayor. It just means that there are questions to be asked. Yeah, you know, people tell, oh, he got 80% of the vote, 80% of the vote. Well, he was handed the mayoralty by Greg Moore. No one else had been allowed to set up. You know, there was no opposition. Like, Mm-hmm. But, you know, he did win, and win, and win, win is a win. <laughs> but let's, let's take an example of someone we know well, Christina Joan Clark, the former, what, 34th, 33rd Premier of British Columbia? I don't remember anymore. <laughs> Anyways, two years ago, three years ago, it comes out, I guess four years ago now, it comes out in the media that, oh my God, Christy Clark, on top of her Premier salary, which I believe is $200,000 a year, um, to run the province, by the way, a $55 billion operation. Uh, anyways, on top of that, she got a $50,000 top up from the BC Liberal Party, ostensibly as the leader of the BC Liberals. Mm-hmm. This was met with the most galling, sexist, miles and miles of pixels, acres of newsprint, attacks, condemnations, demands for uh, transparency, demands for her to resign. The Globe and Mail, and I'm going to cite them specifically, made a meal out of this thing for months. And Gary Mason, the cowardly columnist of the Globe and Mail, and I have like so little respect for this right now, just like would go so hard on Christy Clark for getting this top up. Not a word on Brad West getting $120,000 US from a US steel worker. Like it, it's, it is so mind boggling. And I can't decide if it's um, a double standard because of sexism or if it's double standard because, you know, the Globe are a bunch of pinkos and they all love the NDP and the steel workers and they hate free enterprisers, uh, or if they're just, you know, so COVID blind, they can't see these stories. But why the hell is this coming out through the Georgia Strait? Like, God yeah. bless you, Charlie Smith. And I know the Strait, like, is, like, the Strait is in dire straits. They've cut all of their reporters except essentially Charlie. But, yeah. you know, he still has the most important political piece of this whole, you know, the last 10 weeks. It blows my mind. And so, you know, I, I go on the Globe and Mail website this today because I wanted to double check, make sure I hadn't missed something because, yeah. you know, I'm not a subscriber and I won't give them a penny of my money. <laughs> um, but I go on there and I'm like, okay, well, let's see. You know, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Mace has written something great about this. No, nothing, nothing. Um, they don't even have they don't even have their own piece about the special prosecutor announcing this week that there are no charges, no crimes were committed, no foul play when it came to all of these political donations in that era, which was again a major like the beating drum of the Globe and Mail about this horrible thing and how these politicians were being bought off. Nothing. They're not an inch of like. There's not an inch of space dedicated. There's a CP, a Canadian Press story that they've reprinted online. Nothing by the Globe and Mail reporters. So I, I just find it, like, it just blows my mind that this kind of stuff can happen. And, you know, like, it's one or the other. And this isn't about whataboutism. This is about, yeah. like, if you're going to hold her to account for getting $50,000 from the party she leads in a job role that we all knew she held yes. <laughs> versus, you know, this mayor who you love because he's dreamy and he's good on to articulate and, oh, he fights, he talks bad about money laundering. How much money laundering is happening in Poco? 
Fuck this! Like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, let's talk about this thing. His only, his big files have been anti-China files, which just perfectly fit in with the steelworkers motif. Like, uh, I, I don't understand McLean, and I, 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 if I were a counselor in Poco, I would just be all over this going, hold, hold up, like, we need more. But Poco is a very quiet political climate, and yes, off we go. <laughs> Well, and I mean, to your, your points about the Globe, but it, this story is fairly new. These stories and uh, op-eds and that may well be in the pipeline. We don't they're know. Not. Uh, they're, <laughs> we'll see. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. And then you can correct me uh, when we next meet, and we'll get back to that later. But uh, as for the um, the, the top-up that the, the BC Liberals, uh, the Christy Clark received, rather, uh, we, we've had two special prosecutors come back uh, in the last few months, uh, both saying the same thing. There was no evidence to support uh, proceeding further, and uh, basically we're dropping the matter here and there. Um, in the former, with uh, Ginny Sims, uh, who was being, well, it doesn't matter what she was being accused of, the, the special prosecutor said there wasn't worth proceeding. The NDP caucus issued a release demanding an apology from BC Liberal leader Andrew Wilkinson. Yeah. Uh, and then John Horgan uh, said some things that, I, uh, to be honest, I agree with about the special prosecutor process and how, you know, maybe we need to rethink it. Mm -hmm. Because in this case, Ginny Sims' name had been dragged through the mud for months and she had no recourse but to sort of go away for a while. David Butcher took three years, yeah. three years to look into these allegations. I suspect there will be no meditations on the role of the special prosecutor. I suspect there will be no calls for an apology. And I'm not saying there should be. I'm just saying... Let's have some consistency. Yeah, and you know, John Horgan tis tisking Andrew Wilkinson for making the allegations and passing them on and all that. Where is, you know, was, was it Dix? Was he the one who made the allegations that started all this out? Like someone made their, mm -hmm. I, I believe it was Dix, but it may have been a different NDP cabinet, whatever. Someone from the NDP made the initial uh, complaint to the RCMP that forced the triggering of the special prosecutor on this. They won't be forced to, to uh, apologize. And by God, if it was, if it was Adrian Dix, uh, it won't even uh, tinge his halo a degree. But like, this is, you're right, this is the problem. However, McLean, the last person I want trying to fix special prosecutors in this province is yes. David Eby, who is the most partisan attorney general in a province where we've had a few partisan attorney generals over the year. But he is <laughs> yes. by far the absolute worst. He's butchered the ICBC file. People are still paying full gur for their uh, insurance during a COVID epidemic where every other insurance company, including ICBA, has given refunds and rebates to their customers. Um, he did, mishandled the prop rep thing, tried to politically sl solve that. Let's not let David E. be anywhere near the special prosecutor system. If you're going to have someone fix it, um, find someone outside uh, to do it. But we cannot let him because he's just going to muck it up even worse. I think that's exactly what they need to do. They need to find, um, you know, a panel or a person who is not associated with any of the three major political parties uh, to go and have a look at this. Because, I mean, yeah, it does look like the system needs needs addressing and it should not be addressed by somebody, uh, somebody in politics. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. That should conclude my angry rants for today, but the... Uh, oh, surely not. I don't know. Like, <laughs> I'm sure Brad West is very nice and the media adore him and blah, 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 but I, I just kind of... Uh, eyebrows, my eyebrows are raised and I, I'd like to see more scrutiny of this uh, very questionable, uh, very questionable contract. Yep, questions are worth asking, uh, mm -hmm. and we'll see if this goes any further. Um, what do you think will be the first question? Because we're going to get a, we're going to get question periods again in three weeks. Mm -hmm. I think you, I, I think you touched on it earlier. I think it's the uh, the ICBC and uh, the first real question. I mean, there'll be some general, broad. Can you give us an update type questions first? But the first real question, if you know what I mean, I think yeah. I think we'll be on the ICBC and insurance. I think ICBC. There's a good chance. I think. Um, look. I, I, I think lack of supports for employers. Mm -hmm. um, why are you deferring taxes? Why aren't you actually forgiving taxes? Why are you sitting on $2 billion worth of work safe surplus, not using that to get into the hands of folks to get PPE? That's a possibility. Wet'suwet'en is a possibility. Ah, uh, um, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, if I think that'll be the first non COVID tie related question, probably from Ellis Ross. I would. Yep. That's who that's I would put good, up there. That's a, that's a really good point, actually. Like, let's yep. see you, let's see you, Scott Fraser, match Ellis Ross and when it comes to First Nations reconciliation. Yep. That's the the, the like, only thing I would say about that question is there, I'm not suggesting it's legitimate, but there is an opening for Fraser to sort of hide behind Ottawa. But with ICBC, it's a solely yes. made in Victoria decision. 
Yeah, and, but you know the liberals are still like worried about ICBC being turned back on them, and oh, you know, yeah, we that's had true to, too. We had to hoard this money in order to pay off your mismanagement, blah blah blah. But, um, it, it'll be. I, I think you're probably right. ICBC's got to be high up on the list. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see a story or a question about gaming grants if they haven't made a, mm-hmm. an announcement by them. Uh, that affects every community across the province, yeah. and if you suddenly shutter that 140 million dollar year program. You're putting arts, culture, sports, um, uh, social services out of business. Um, and it's a program that I don't think a lot of um, British Columbians actually know about, to be honest. I mean, it's uh, it's certainly uh, always top of mind in the legislature because the, the releases for gaming grants yes. are sort of a steady flow. But for the average person, I don't think they realize that, that money from casinos actually goes towards everything from, you know, your local minor hockey league team to, you know, the art ga- the struggling art gallery or, or uh, collective theater across the street. Um, yeah. These are real examples, by the way, in my neighborhood here in Fernwood. Yeah. Um, but... I mean, that's where the money comes from. Yeah, up to about $100,000. Langley Minor Hockey gets the yeah. max, which is $100,000 a year. And, you know, to put that in context, that's 10% of rice costs, right? Like, it's a big yeah. chunk of money that goes a long way. And if we don't get it, we need to make other plans, and there'll be definite impacts on services. Um, you, you know what? Actually, I'll tell an old story about from Langley Council. So when Langley, um, Langley City got a casino, Langley Township did not. And mm-hmm. I was fine with that. Langley Township, um, though, had a bingo hall at the time, and the bingo hall asked to put 50 slot machines in. And it came to council, and, and you know, the mayor and I had talked beforehand, and the mayor was in support, and I was pretty much the only one on council who didn't support it. And, uh, but you know, I said, look, I'm not gonna, like sometimes on issues you go out and you make a big deal, and other issues you just don't support and you just kind of move on, right? And this was one where I was like, I'm not gonna go stir up the neighborhood. I'm not gonna get pitchforks and, you know, torches and here, like, I, I see both sides of this. I just not comfortable with voting for it. So we have the public hearing and this, this little bingo hall brings up 30 different Langley uh, NGOs, sports associations, all this stuff, all of whom stand up one by one we, we, we support this, we need the money, blah, blah, blah. One after, like, and every, like, major group, like, you know, the curling club and the arts club and the drama, like, you're like, holy smokes, we get it, we get it, you, you need the money. There was one charity in the room, it was uh, Youth for Christ, and he got up and he said, um, you know, well, I, I'm just here to speak against this, we do work in that community, and we're a little concerned about the socioeconomic impacts of this, very respectful. And the crowd was like, and he's like, and we don't take any of this money, so there's no financial impact on us. We understand that. Well, then these other 30 executive directors of these charities start yelling. I'm like, you must take money. How do you make a go of if you don't take their money? Oh, yeah. And he's like, well, we don't. Like, this is not what we do. Like, we come, <laughs> let's have coffee. I'll show you my books. Like, we're not taking this money. So it, it was a very, uh, you know, you know, I, I've still voted against it. I wrote a letter to each of those 30 presenters and said, look, I love what your club does. I just didn't feel comfortable doing it. I was the only vote against. The thing passed and, and you know, the Bingo Palace is out of business now. But, um, and those clubs are still getting their money somehow, magically. But, you know, it's the, it is a very sensitive issue and, you know, community after community after community, you can bet as executive directors start to worry about whether these, this money is coming through, their MLAs are getting calls. NDP, Green, Liberal, doesn't matter. And those MLAs are going to the minister responsible for gaming who I get, is it mm-hmm. Farney? Is it Soljan? Is uh, it Bibi? That is a great question. That I don't, I don't know, know the answer to you. I think it is, I think it is Mike Farnworth. Mm-hmm. They'll be all over Farney and uh, I, I'm sure there'll be an announcement that that 140 million will be, will be saved. Yeah. What, um, I was, uh, now I have quite lost my next question. I apologize. <laughs> well, can we touch on the wet sweat and really quick? Yes, thank you. That's what it was. Yeah. So they had this agreement signed between the hereditary mm-hmm. chiefs, Canada and BC. It was kept secret. Um, then COVID hit, but the Wet'suwet'en chiefs said they were still going out and building community uh, engagement. They issue a press release, the hereditary chiefs and the province and the Fed saying we're signing tomorrow, uh, coming yeah. up, and it's all hunky-dory and everyone's on board. And then record scratch. Uh, the elected council, so people actually elected to represent the Wet'suwet'en are say, uh, sorry, we're not on board, we oppose this, and we don't think they actually did any consultation or much consultation beyond their own little uh, families uh, on very rickety, unrecorded Zoom calls. Um, McLean, <laughs> like, 
how can they sign this thing with that hanging over it? I I don't know. It's uh, it's not like they went out and sought out the, the people in the Wet'suwet'en who agreed with what they say they want to do, um, which in this case we're talking about the Coastal Gaslink Pipeline. But it, it's hard to see how they could ignore what appears to be, at the very least, a wide swath of Wet'suwet'en opinion. It's at at the very least, it, it does not seem self-evident that the the, wet, the hereditary chiefs speak broadly for on behalf of the wet sweat and people because that is disputed by the wet sweat and themselves. This is uh, I, I think it was D- Dallas Smith wrote a piece for the Orca a while back and he's writing another one uh, in the next couple days uh, weighing in on this um, basically saying that the wet sweat need to figure this out themselves mm-hmm. and they need to kind of tell everyone else to go away for a little while until they resolve this what is clearly an internal dispute mm-hmm. about in, about governance. Uh, and it's sad that it's happening now and in real time. And while there's obviously uh, things driving it, but it, picking sides, which is exactly what Ottawa and Victoria seem to have done, is only going to lead to long-term division and pain. And it, it's not; it doesn't resolve it. It just makes it worse. I think uh, was it Ellis Ross saying that you know, uh, not this exact pro- process, but something similar happened to his nation and took a generation to to get past that and get everyone on the same page again. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And then, and then decide with the, the non-democratic part. Decide with essentially the monarchy. And at a time where two or three of those chiefs are under suspicion because they kicked out women, female chiefs, who were actually the hereditary chiefs because they didn't agree with their stance on Coles against. Like, it's just, it's bizarre to me it's gotten this far. It's bizarre to me that, well, I don't think much of Scott Fraser, so I'm not going to say it's bizarre to me that he would get sucked into this, but... Uh, we all remember Scott's tots as the legislature closed uh, just before COVID-19. <laughs> um, but I just, how can they sign this in good faith knowing the Democratic folks are opposed to it and knowing that it, it, it reminds me, it feels like a Star Trek episode where the Federation accidentally gets embroiled in a civil war on a planet and then <laughs> yeah. about halfway through they realize they're on the wrong side, right? Like, yeah. oh, we thought this was the actually the good people, but they're not and uh, we should be on that side. And you know, you, then you have the moral quandary and we all remember why the prime directive is important never to get involved. Um, this is, you know, that situation. So I would hope someone, I would hope John Horgan and Justin Trudeau kind of give their head a shake and say, hold up, we're not signing anything until you guys decide what is best for your community. Uh, but I think they're so desperate. I think they're so blinded by the term reconciliation um, that they probably will just plunge ahead. Yeah, I, there was a line in uh, Von Palmer's piece this morning. Uh, it wasn't his line. He was quoting uh, one of the uh, elected chiefs saying, this is 19th century treaty making. This is not 21st century reconciliation. I thought that was a great line. Hmm. Um, and I, it sounds kind of emblematic where they have chosen you. We have chosen the people that, that speak on behalf of this nation that we're negotiating with. And ignoring little things like, well, they actually held elections. <laughs> Ignoring the Indian <laughs> Act, which tells them that yeah. they have to talk to the elected yeah. councils. Like, ignoring the actual law of the land. So, how did the 19th century treaty uh, negotiations go, by the way? Like, how did that all turn out? Everything's hunky dory, right? Yeah, I think it's all fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, I'm not sure uh, Scott Fraser is going to go down in history as a, uh, as a great uh, Indigenous Affairs uh, minister here in British Columbia, but I could be wrong. It's early. Well, Who knows? Yeah, he's got a year or so at least so uh, to, to turn thing, turn the ship around, but it, it, it has not been a good year for him, that's for sure. No, no. Um, McLean, can you explain to me what the hell is wrong with your Victoria City Council? Oh, man. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I'm just going to listen like this. I, you, know the, you know the worst part of this is? The worst part is I'm not 100% clear on which story you want me to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just before we went on air, I was looking at um, a, a thread from the Victoria Police Department uh, mm-hmm. confirming their uh, crime rate increase stats. Uh, and this is something I am very interested in because I live a block from one of the one of the tent cities. Um, mm-hmm. And yes, we have noticed a major difference. And it was all about ways you can. Yes, it's basically saying yeah, property th- uh, crime and theft and vandalism have gone through the roof. What are you complaining uh, about? Just, what are you complaining about? It's been eight days since the last time someone's been shot with a crossbow. In oh my god, <laughs> that was that was a block, a block from where I'm sitting right now. Uh, and it's an intersection that I cross with my child. Um, not recently, 
not anymore, but you know, regularly <laughs> no. because it's a block from here. Um, it's so these, uh, and basically the thread was not, um, r you know, rest assured we're working harder. Da -da -da -da. It was here are things you can do to make your property safer. Um, you know, don't don't have your bikes visible. Um, trim your hedges so there's nowhere to hide. That kind of thing. I mean, it's very blame the victim kind of stuff. So, but I suspect that's not what you want me to talk about. You want me to talk about uh, the Beacon Hill Park situation where yeah. they're trying to ban cars and um which is something they've been trying to do for a while and then uh there was a motion within victoria city council it has since been amended mm -hmm. uh because they got a lot of feedback from it's victoria senior citizens basically saying if you do this i will never get to see the park again now didn't they get the uh, and, didn't it happen like they had the motion and then adam sterling did a show and then the motion was ma magically changed <laughs> Yes, yeah. Uh, and they showed the motion. The motion was great. It included, like, I think it was, uh, I want to say a New Yorker cartoon, but yeah. I apologize if it isn't, showing, you know, people trying to cross a sidewalk, but the sidewalk is actually like a, the Grand Canyon, and they're walking on this, like, tiny, narrow little plank. It was ridiculous. If you've seen traffic in Victoria, you know that that's maybe a bit of an exaggeration, <laughs> and especially in Beacon Hill Park, where the speed limit is, like, 20. Yeah. <laughs> I, I go to Beacon Hill Park all the time, and uh, it is just far away enough that um, we drive because mm -hmm. I have a five-year-old, mm -hmm. and if we're going to be there for longer than 15 minutes, driving and parking in front of his favorite playground or the hill where we go up and uh, look at the peacocks and all that, it's a fantastic park. Yeah. I, I don't see the reason to make it harder for everyday Victorians to get to. Mm -hmm. um, and there'll be people saying, well, we need to expand the bus routes and all that and great and forth. But when I have an hour window, I can't wait 20 minutes for the bus. I yeah. just can't. And I don't see a future in which, you know, bus service on the regular every two minutes is going to come to a city the size of Victoria, which the city of Victoria is like 60,000 people. You yeah. can fit us all in BC Place. Yeah. Um, and so it Please just don't. doesn't Please seem don't. realistic. You got to be socially distanced. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and so I'm not suggesting that they can't look at more ways to improve the pedestrian experience at Beacon Hill Park. They already did close one of the roads in it uh, in the time since I've moved here. But... The problem the Victoria City Council has is that they seem so willing over and over and over and over again to take any opportunity to push something like this. Um, it's they've don't already let, closed a bunch of roads. Don't let a crisis for, go to waste. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. And so that, the credibility is, is kind of down the tubes. Now, I will give them credit. They did amend their motion. Mm -hmm. They did listen to some feedback, and that is a good thing. But it is just sort of... It, it becomes a thing where every time you hear Victoria City Council is proposing something, there's a part of you that just goes, oh, God, what now? Yeah. What now? Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's entertaining for me to watch on Twitter. But <laughs> I wouldn't want to live there, that's for sure. Um, no, I, I won't tell you which city councillor liked to tweet about um, I, when people were making fun of, was it Vancouver, when they had the, the council meeting where yeah. you could hear a flush? Yes. And I, I tweeted something to the effect of, I would laugh, but my own city council uh, entertained a motion to ban poinsettias. And I will not tell you which city councillor uh, liked, and I think even retweeted before hastily removing both. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is, uh, that's good stuff. Well, uh, be safe from your Victoria council. They're, they're on the warpath. Someone, where was I reading? Someone, oh, how, actually, no, how is the situation at Topaz Park? Why not? Because Oppenheimer now is basically empty. It's a yep. disaster, but it's basically empty. Uh, they've um, moved to another park. There's a small group now in another park in, B in Vancouver, but they'll, they're working on that. Yep. What's the situation there at the two parks in Victoria? Topaz is further away from me and I think was the bigger of the two parks. Topaz was an actual park. Yeah. Um, and so they had a lot more room there to set up tents. Um, I, I only see it from afar, but it does look as though it's thinned out. I don't have... A percentage. I, I think it's close to half, but this is a guess. Sure. Pandora, which is a street and literally just has boulevards that people are camping along, and this is where I near where I live. I live on Pandora Avenue. Um, it is somewhat thinner, but it is not even close to half. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, um, the I'm trying to think of a nicer word than spillover um, is block completely blocked off the sidewalk, where there is literally a pile of there's no nice way to, to say this garbage mm -hmm. and it is a mound that is literally chest high i'm not making this up and it takes over the entire sidewalk it is literally impassable wow um yeah it, it's not good and there is the other day i was walking driving past uh because i have to 
And um, there's, you know, literally six what looked like brand new bikes stacked outside of one tent. And uh, I mean, that's just bikes. You see everything from barbecues, um, more recycling and compost bins that the city issues and that you have to pay for if you lose, lose, mm. um, then I can count. Um, uh, leather chairs and ottomans. I mean, it, oh, uh, it, it's bizarre. Hmm. And it is slightly thinner. And the city has done uh, a good job of when they do remove a tent, they actually put big blue fencing around the area so no one can get back in there. And so they have, uh, I'm trying to use another word than reclaimed, yeah. but they have uh, managed to keep people off land, uh, little parts of land where there had been tents. And they have done a good job of that. But it is spilling out literally into the sidewalks. And I would say that there are still probably two-thirds to three-quarters the number of tents and people there. Mm -hmm. Now, again, this is very unscientific, and not all the tents are one-person tents. Right. So it, it can be very hard to say. But it is still dense, and it is still, it, well, the statistics say it's still very dangerous. Yeah, wow, that's uh, scary. It is I something mean... that has... I mean, we, we joke and laugh a lot on the show. This is something that legitimately causes me to lose a significant amount of sleep at night. Yeah. And um, rare is the night that I don't hear someone, you know, climbing over the fence into our garbage and recycling area and going through it, which is fine. Take all the recycling. That's great. Yeah. But when I have to clean uh, needles, which happens fairly regularly, and um, there's no nice way to say this either, but human feces. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's not great. That's no. tough. That's tough. Um, yeah, I got nothing to add to I that. Hope, <laughs> no, I, I, you know what? I hope every single one of those people, I, I wish yeah. uh, the best for, I hope they find uh, good spots and shelter and that they get the help that they obviously need. Mm. Nobody is, uh, you know, suggesting this is a problem we need to ignore, but I think the evidence is uh, in and fairly, fairly clear that tent cities are not a solution that is tenable. Right. Um, we need to do more and we need to find other and better solutions, but tent cities cannot be one of them. No, no. And certainly not in public parks and public spaces. That's, no. That's not fair to anyone. Um, you want to talk about Brian Adams? <laughs> <laughs> not really. <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, it was, I'm only going to say terrible, this. terrible, terrible post. I'm only going to say this. I saw this tweet and I, I, I tweet about it and uh, I have to admit, I laughed out loud. It said, Don Cherry, racist. Brian Adams, racist. Justin Trudeau, costume enthusiast. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought of that angle. But, uh, I didn't have the guts uh, to retweet it, though. I was too chicken. I, I had heard the firestorm about Brian Adams before I saw his actual post. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it, it's, you know, a few sentences long. And it's one of those things where you read, like, you're having this real-time reaction. You read the first sentence, and you're like, well, that's not bad. Yeah. And then the second one, you're like, oh, Ooh. come on, that's not so bad. And then, and then oh, Ooh. oh, Ooh. oh, Brian. Ooh. <laughs> it's just such that's... a self-inflicted like self yeah. wound, right? Like, dude, okay, you're upset about the residency in London or whatever. Just say something nice about London. Like, hey, London fans, I miss you. I can't wait to be back. You know, we're going to kick COVID's ass, and off we go. But no, no. We went for bat soups, <laughs> wet markets, yeah, the, the, and uh, yeah. Well, I was going to say the worst, but the worst part is that it was it was a pretty clearly, obviously racist thing to say. Yeah. But the, it was terrible also in that he had a really nice idea in that he was going to start performing for free on Instagram. <laughs> we we listened to Patrick Stewart read a sonnet by yeah. William Shakespeare every single night at dinner, and I enjoy this, and it's become sort of a little family tradition. And it's just sort of something he's doing to help us all pass the time, and it's kind of wonderful. <laughs> Brian Adams was trying to do something similar, and, well, it may have ended his career. <laughs> I don't know why we're laughing. It's terrible. It's terrible. It it's so terrible. But it's just such it's a just random... self-inflicted wound. It, it yeah. was so. It was the post was so terribly awful over the line. It yeah. almost seemed like a parody. Like it's I think a... that's what. Yeah, exactly. And it's such a random Canadian celebrity to do it. Like, okay, Chad Kruger says something like that. Well, Nickelback's a little rough around the edges. You know, yeah. their songs. Everyone are... likes Brian Adams. Yeah, but well, Brian like, Adams as a person. Yeah. Well, yeah. not anymore. Boy, the. Uh... Yeah. The uh, the media ladies they were turning on Brian Adams fast on my Twitter stream. Oof. That was uh, that was something. I do enjoy all the puns though people used from his songs to uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can't stop this thing he started. That was my favorite one. 
<laughs> I don't think any one person gets the credit. Uh, hey, excellent. We don't have time to talk about Corona Karens in the media, but that's probably good. I've already lashed the uh, Globe and Mail enough for one, uh, no. for one episode. So. And this is probably a good time mm-hmm. to share the news that you and I won't see each other for, I think, three weeks. Yes, I'm finally getting a, a new co-host. It's very exciting. No, I'm just kidding. You're, you're finally getting rid of me. You're, uh, you're on your way. <laughs> We are going to try something fun with our good friends at Unspun. Um, we're going to do a little a little mixing and matching we'll uh, next week. Uh, it'll be Unspun with Jody Vance and McLean K. That is a downgrade if I ever saw one. And it'll, of course, it'll be BC Holly Up Hot Stove with uh, Jordan Bateman and Underscore, which is an upgrade. And yes. then the week after, we'll do the reverse. It'll be uh, myself and George Affleck and Jordan and Jody Vance. And I am looking forward to all four shows very, very much. And in fact, the next time we talk, you and I, when we do uh, you know, Hot Stove Classic, I might be back in the legislature. That'll be crazy. It'll be crazy. I no, I, I'm looking forward to talking with George. I want to see how riled up we can, he and I can become. Oh, um, man. Uh, hopefully uh, Candy Stewart does something really stupid. I'm crossing my fingers. Shouldn't be tough this week. Uh, it'll be great. Uh, you and Jody will be much more reasonable. And then, right. um, and then uh, that gives me a week to prep for my, uh, my uh, time with Jody where I can uh, you know, start kind of uh, just poking her a little bit around density in Kitsilano just to see what will happen. Yeah, and I, I have a week to prepare my every week George uh, does a, a new take on uh, saying unspun. I guess I got to, first I have to try and then you have to try. Yes. We're going to have to try and live up to it. It's a lot to live up to. Yes, that's a good point. I haven't thought of that. Unspun. You got two weeks. You got two weeks to think about Underscore it. Underscore spun. I don't know. I'll, I'll figure something <laughs> out. That's good. Oh, you can, don't steal that. I, trademark. I won't. I won't. I got to have my own. So that's good. That's good. Anyways, uh, I, right. think, I think you and I are looking forward to it more than they are because, uh, you know, we're a, little, I'm a little more, we're a little more bombastic over here maybe then. That's true. Well, yeah. we'll see. This should be fun. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I, um, uh, not that I won't miss you. <laughs> yeah, I'll miss you, McLean. <laughs> McLean, we can still talk. Like, we don't just have that's to talk true. on the phone. We can still just that's pick true. up the phone. And... Uh, no, it's fine. Three weeks. We'll see you then. <laughs> <laughs> fine. Fine. I don't want to talk to you guys anyway. That was fine. Before right. underscore. Uh, I, I don't think I could possibly top anything other than that. I have nothing else. Do you? I have nothing else. <laughs> okay. Well, so next week on BC Poly Hot Stove, you can look forward to seeing Jordan and George Affleck. And on Unspun, it'll be myself and Jody. Um, but until then, you can find us online on YouTube, Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, and of course, the mothership on the orchid.ca. I'm at McLean K. He's at Jordan Bateman. And this was BC Poly Hot Stove. Hashtag pray for underscore.